Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Before we introduce our guest, just a very quick note slash reminder, we will not be discussing the candidates tournament. This is more of a long form reflection on our guest's career Uh, for candidates content. Tune into our Friday bonus pods, but we will have lots to discuss with our illustrious guest, who is a Moldova-born, Romania-based chess professional, commentator, blogger, chessable author. She's the strongest female player in Romania. She's been as high as top 30 in the world among female players. Currently, FIDE rated around 2,400. She's a five-time Olympiad member, won the bronze medal there in 2014, was the youngest Moldova women's champion at the age of 14, and she is joining us amidst a busy summer in April. She won the Premier Group at the Capablanca Memorial in Cuba, and she just won first place at the Targu Mures, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing in Romania. So without further ado, let's welcome Irina Bulmaga to the show. How are you, Irina? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm doing fine, enjoying my last vacation be- uh, before a summer, like you said, full of action. So, yeah, last day of vacation, and I'm actually very, very glad to join the podcast. Yeah, thank you. You've been posting some amazing pictures uh, of the Greek islands. I live in the suburbs in New Jersey, and I'd, I'd be willing to trade locations with you. Now, Irina... <laughs> You um you've as you as we've said you've been super busy with your chess and now that you're joining us from a vacation I'm sure that gives you some time to reflect on your life and your chess. So as you do so how do you feel about your recent games and and what is going on with uh with the state of your chess game? Well, this is a very nice question. Well, uh, last year, I've been struggling quite a lot because I was at my peak form just be, before the pandemic. So like uh, beginning of 2020, I had a fantastic uh, year. I was winning almost each tournament I was playing, like the first female prize or winning some ELO points. And I got a lot of nice opportunities, but then um, the pandemic came and somehow I perhaps did not deal too well with it. And I had a terrible year last year. I lost 70 ELO points and the results were far from what I hoped for. And I had to change a little bit my mindset and everything and... um, Actually, before the Capablanca Memorial, which uh, you mentioned, I was very down with myself and um, I was trying to do things differently because uh, I'm a player who really goes with the mood. Like, you know, if I win first game or I have a good few games in the beginning of the tournament, then I might have a very good event. But if I lose a game, which... I had to win, (laughs) I had a winning position, then it's very difficult for me to get back in the game. And I tried to change that to think that, okay, it was a lost opportunity, a lost chance, but I will keep the good mood. And this is what I changed this year. And I'm pretty happy with the results. And also I am quite content with myself because the first time since like my childhood, I believe, I just enjoy practicing chess and training just for the sake of training not for the sake of hoping for a good result or something so i'm just enjoying the process and i actually have an interesting plan for next year but perhaps it's a bit early to disclose it (laughs) oh wow well there's so much to follow up on there Irina. so first of all you describing this sort of uh you you assess yourself as what we might call sort of like a momentum player. When when things are riding high, you feel like things uh, you can continue that. But when things aren't going as well, one can enter into sort of a spiral. Um, I think a lot of people listening will be able to to relate to that. 
Um, they might even be surprised that someone at, at your level experiences the same thing. Um, although I, I know that, that it can occur at any level in chess. But my question for you, Irina, is you say you've solved that, but you're also going really well lately. So how do you know for sure that you've solved it when you're also putting up good results? Uh, well, it wasn't that my last result, the one you mentioned in the Romanian, it's actually Târgu Mureș, but okay, it involves <laughs> some yeah. <laughs> Romanian yeah. pronunciation. But it wasn't like it was very good. I mean, I still lost to ELO points, but I didn't lose any game. And out of nine games, I made, made seven draws and two wins. And um, I had two winning positions, like plus six and plus nine, which I didn't convert. And that was quite surprising. But I managed to not get too disappointed and just be patient, which is something uh, I'm usually not very likely to do. <laughs> and uh, I was very content that I managed, you know, just to just to enjoy chess and not put so much pressure on myself because usually I want maximum from myself. I want, okay, I if I prepare hard for a tournament, I expect myself to be up for the task to be, perform well. And if I don't, I am getting disappointed and um, yeah, then I don't perform even at the lowest expected level. So uh, yeah, I think in that terms, things are going quite fine but uh, i uh, i will play a tournament a very strong one a ladies tournament and that is something perhaps i should mention that uh, i usually don't enjoy much to play ladies tournaments i feel that um, like the psychological pressure is much higher um unlike when i play an open tournament and uh, i don't face only female players uh, but this will going to be a very good test. Uh, the tournament starts in a few days on 25th, actually. Okay. I mean, that's interesting because, um, as I mentioned to you briefly before we were recording, you've got a blog which traces like, you know, nine years or something of your evolution as a person and as a chess player. And it's really interesting to read. And one thing that struck me, there were a lot of things that struck me, but one was um, just how sort of close knit the professional chess community is, particularly where you are in Europe. I mean, you, you see a lot of familiar faces. I get the impression you have a lot of close friends, um, probably particularly amongst your fellow strong female players. Um, so is that why you think you, you enjoy these events less or, or why do you think it, it is that you, per, that you prefer uh, large open tournaments or at least open tournaments? You know, uh, I was thinking about it quite a lot because in 2019, when my results were going up, I was playing mostly all female tournaments and I was performing very well. But in 2021, I did the same thing and things were going completely the other direction. But uh, I think that uh, the pressure was too much for me. The expectations were too high because when you are lower rated, for example, when I was 2380 and I was playing tournaments uh, with opponents like 2450 females then okay draw was already a good result the win was already more than I would expect but when you are going into a tournament as a favorite things are different but my feeling is that when I'm playing these tournaments against men and this was actually my experience from this recently finished open in Romania it did not matter if I played against 24, 25 or 2200, everybody wanted to win against me. Like uh, they felt that, I don't know, but this was my feeling that even when I played against 2200, when I play against a lady with 2200, draw is fine for them. But here everybody wanted just to win oh, against interesting. me. interesting, yeah. Yeah, and uh, psychologically it was just much easier because you just play your game and you don't feel like you have to prove anything. Like, you know, you don't have to perform better than uh, a lady or someone. Like you can just play calmly your chess. And also I enjoy actually playing against, but I, I believe that's about most of the players that everybody enjoys playing against stronger players because you have nothing to lose. You have only things to win. And when you have to play against lower rated opponents, then 
uh, sometimes you don't perform. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, at your best. Right. I mean, I a lot of people feel that way, but some people might be bothered by the specter of of obviously if if someone plays someone if someone plays a stronger field, they're going to lose more often. Um, so that doesn't bother you. The fact that your your expected score would be lower if you're playing a field of twenty six hundreds than twenty two hundreds. No, this doesn't bother me as, uh, at all because uh, for me it's painful when. Uh, I lose against a lower rated opponent, but not even when I lose against them, but when they out uh, outplay me from a position of weakness. So, for example, when I have a winning position or a big advantage and then I mess it up, then it's painful. If it's a logical game and I play a bad game and they play a good game, I think, okay, I did my best, they had a good day, that's it, you know. But when I had the chance and I messed it up, then it's painful. And uh, usually it happens more often against lower rated opponents than against stronger ones because you either don't get the chance or, yeah, or you don't get the chance. (laughs) And following up on what you were saying earlier, Irina, um, you mentioned you felt part of the reason that you feel like you've sort of turned the ship around is that you've re-embraced a sort of studying for its own sake, studying for enjoyment. And I'm curious, like, how you managed to do that and what sort of study brings you joy? Like, what what do you do when you're trying to have that mindset? I was quite lucky because um, one, I mean, my best friend, chess friend, she recommended to me a coach. And uh, I was very... Mm, I mean, I never really enjoyed working on chess with coaches uh, after uh, I started being an adult. I mean, I did it in my childhood and teens, but uh, then I developed my way of seeing chess and it was very difficult for me to build a a trust relationship with a coach. So um, I tried mostly to work by myself. And this friend of mine, she recommended me this grandmaster and I really somehow connected with him immediately and I was expecting you know all of our training sessions I was waiting for them and it somehow brought back the joy of just studying chess and what I liked is that he also uh, recommended uh, uh, a lot of books to me and I love reading and I rediscovered my love for reading chess books (laughs) because uh, yeah, it it wasn't a thing I did uh, I did much, but uh, yeah, now I have at least I don't know five six books I'm reading per month, and uh, I'm enjoying the process. And I think it's the most important that I don't do it just because I know that I have in order to play well or something, but I just enjoy doing that. That's great. Well, I don't know if you'd be willing to say who your coach is. I'm sure our listeners would be interested, but we'd also like to hear which books, Irina. Uh, all right. So uh, from the latest, which I read, uh, was uh, Michael Adams uh, with... Um, uh, I think like with, a super GM. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a great that's book. one of them. And then uh, surprisingly, I didn't uh, read this uh, Jonathan Rosen's uh, The Seven Capital Seven Scenes. Deadly Chess Sins. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I liked, okay, from Adam's book, I liked a lot the puzzles and like uh, really the chess content. But from Rosen's book, I really loved how the book is written. Like the content, uh, it's, it's like I read a novel, you know, I just yeah. can't let it go. <laughs> uh, and now I've started also to read uh, this recently published uh, Ramesh, uh, uh, Ramesh book with a lot of puzzles and calculation exercises. <laughs> yeah, it's hard work, that book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so I'm curious, did you, uh, funny enough, um, I mean, obviously, interviewing chess players and authors every week, I'm relatively on top of the chess literature. And as it happened, I've I've interviewed all three individuals that you mentioned and of course uh read the books as well um think like a gm a super gm i found particularly interesting just because of its sort of unique approach and um uh, appeal to a wide range of players so i'm curious irina if you went through all the exercises and got this got the score and all that stuff i think i'm at about number 33 right now 
but it was actually quite depressing because when I started the book, I was uh, in that lowest point you know, <laughs> I had, and I didn't get correctly the first two or three. And actually, when I started to read uh, how the players were thinking, I, I saw that I'm thinking exactly like 1500 or oh, 1700. No. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, <laughs> what is wrong? It cannot be. Perhaps my whole chess is, I don't know, something like a fraud or something. I don't know. And then I, I realized, okay, I kept going. And one example I got, I think it was one of the only ones with which Michael Adams didn't get correctly. I got it correctly in like five seconds. Right. And I thought, okay, okay, things things are all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I performed about my rating in the book, but the fact that I got one puzzle that Adams didn't get, like, you know, that, that makes the whole book worth it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I was <laughs> what I was talking about. But you've played and drew Michael Adams, so it shouldn't have been as big a shock to you, right? Uh, no, actually, it was a very special game, that one where I drew him, because uh, a friend of mine, a grandmaster, he was telling me, okay, now you get this opportunity once in a lifetime to play against Michael Adams. Just look how he moves the pawns. <laughs> because, you know, this is a whole art. They never go back. He knows in which end game they will be useful on which square. And I was so happy to survive that game. And I was very surprised that he... I mean, I, I did not know. I, I would think that he would be disappointed after drawing me, but he was very happy to discuss the game with me. And it was an amazing experience, uh, the whole Isle of Man tournament, actually, that year. Yeah, he's he's a class act, uh, for sure. Um, so you you didn't reveal who your coach is. Is that something you'd rather not reveal? I'm just, there might be people looking for a coach listening is the reason I follow up on that. Uh, actually, I think it's not a secret. He did not mind, uh, I believe, and I also don't mind. It's a well-known GM, uh, Lubomir Vtachnik. Oh, yeah. He did, uh, uh, he did a lot of uh, work with good chess players, and this day he's more of a coach, and I really like his approach and also his taste in wine. <laughs> okay, excellent. Yeah, he likes he likes uh, wine and books, so he's I, yeah. I like him already. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, okay, so for listeners, I'll try to track down his info. But a lot of these players of uh, Grandmaster Fatadnik's stature, they may not necessarily work with club level players. So uh, just just something to bear in mind. But ju just in case, we'll uh, we'll try to get that information in the show notes. Now, Irina, you mentioned you've got this women's only tournament coming up. Um, are you playing, and obviously you're a many-time Olympiad participant, are you playing uh, this time around? Yeah, I'm going to play in India. Okay, and obviously representing Romania? Uh, yeah, assuming that I get the visa. <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, those, those, those can be tense moments waiting for uh, for visas like that. And do you take, I mean, again, I really enjoyed your blog, and of course you um, memorialized a couple of the Olympiads that you've played in. Previously, um, do you place special import on an event like that? To me, thinking of it like imagining that I were, you know, a player of your stature and a chess professional, I might find it sort of double edged because, um, on the one hand, uh, you want to put your best foot forward, you're representing your country, but it also seems like there's like a reunion aspect to it because just the whole professional chess world is there. Um, so, how do you, do you approach that tournament differently? Is my question. Yeah, it, uh, it, it is a difficult question because in the beginning when I just joined the Romanian team, I was uh, barely the reserve player when I first played in 2010. So there were a lot of stronger players in the team whom I was looking up to them. And uh, um, back in that days, it actually felt much easier to play in the team, even though there were challenges because I was coming from a different country and it, okay, there were some like tensions. It's not so easy to blend in, though I, I have to say that it was much easier than I expected. <laughs> but uh, from the point when I started to play board one, it changed a little bit because the pressure was much higher and I was um, 
uh, somehow used to scoring a lot of points on the lower boards and suddenly I had to play the first board where I played against world and European champions only and uh, it wasn't that easy of a task. And the first time I played well, but then um, I had a disastrous event in 2018 in the Batumi Olympiad when I lost five, five games in a row and it was very traumatizing. And somehow uh, the team atmosphere also uh, wasn't great. And I'm very much of a team player. I enjoy team events a lot and I usually perform better than my level there. But uh, there was a problem like, um, in the team, I mean, the flow wasn't <laughs> wasn't mm. wasn't there, and uh, I'm actually very happy that this year things changed uh, uh, because we didn't have um, training sessions with the team before the tournaments for the past uh, few Olympiads and European Team Championships, and now this changed. We worked together, we got to know each other better because. It is actually funny that I used to be the young player in an established team where everybody knew each other, but now actually I'm the established and there are young players whom I don't know. And it is difficult to to understand uh, how they think, uh, how they want to spend time and everything. And these training sessions, I think they help a lot because everybody feels uh, much more at ease with each other. And I believe that the atmosphere in the team is very important. And I actually, um, I have noticed that in women's chess, it's like more than 50% of the result is how you feel together as a team. And yeah, that's why I'm pretty happy with how things are going now. And I'm quite confident with, uh, with the prospects of our team at the Olympiad. That's interesting. Do you think that the team dynamic plays a greater impact for, for women's team events than for men's team events? Somehow I've noticed that, yes, because uh, it's uh, quite difficult to... I mean, there are still men's teams which work even though uh, their personal relationships are not great, say they don't speak with each other, but for ladies, I think that never, never works. I huh. mean, mm, any mm. theories on, on why that is? Mm, not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not either. But yeah, they're certainly like the United States men's team are known not to be best friends and they, they seem to do okay. Mm. So is uh, in the in the Women's Olympiad, the upcoming tournament, Irina, is, uh, is China the favorite? Or do, do you do you have a sense of uh, who the strongest teams are? Yeah, I believe that by rating China is definitely going to be the first rated one, uh, given that Russia will most probably not be able to, to play. But there are many teams who are very close, like India will have a very interesting team with a lot of youngsters. And that's actually something which, uh, which is very important to have another generation coming because it keeps you motivated and you cannot relax. And I'm happy that in our team, we also have two youngsters, uh, 17 year old, two players. And there is also the team of Poland who recently got the reinforcement, Alina Kaszlinska, my right. yeah. good friend. And uh, of course, uh, there are also other strong teams. Yeah. Okay, well, it, well, it'll be fun to watch. And I know you're extremely well traveled, Irina. Have you been to India before? Yeah, I've been to India in 2011, actually uh, to the same city, to Chennai, uh, for World Juniors. Um, but it was a terrible experience. <laughs> so, uh, well, this time I expect, uh, okay, despite... All of my friends are saying that it's going to be very good. I expect the worst and I hope uh, to be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> are, are you speaking in terms of like the organization or like uh, f food issues or, or what, what was the problem? Yeah, I lost six kilos in 12 days and uh, I couldn't eat like anything. I ate something in the first uh, two days and then it was a disaster. And uh, I couldn't get out of the hotel back then because, well, it was 
it was painful just to go out to see. I mean, I wasn't prepared for seeing life going on on the streets in that way, like people doing everything on the streets, like, you know, taking showers uh, and eating, li basically living on the streets. Yeah. And you, you had to be careful where you step. And uh, yeah, perhaps, perhaps I was too young. I don't know. I was still 17 or 18, but it was painful for me. I mean, I didn't go out of the hotel after that first time. So I just stayed in and uh, it was a bit tough. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, disheartening. Well, as you say, hopefully, uh, hopefully the things have improved there. And obviously, you're older and probably have more friends. And um, hopefully you can focus on the chess. Um, all right. Well, Irina, we need to take a break to hear from our sponsors. And then I want to hear more about your chess and chess travels. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by aimchess.com. My latest discovery on aimchess.com is in addition to its algorithm generating statistics and telling you trends from your opening games, there's a tab at the top where you can go to game history and review individual games and it tags recurring issues. So for example, it keeps telling me I had good openings, but it also tells me when I was behind on the clock, when I failed to convert an advantage. So you can then within the aim chess platform, review the game and look for uh, leaks that you need to plug things to correct. So one of the many ways you can use aimchess.com to improve your game. So you can check it out for free. And if you choose to subscribe, use the code perpetual 30 to save 30%, or you can also use the link on aimchess.com that is provided in the show description. And we are back. And in in reading through Irina's blog, which she confessed to me before we were recording, she's not sure how, how certain she'll be updating it. She is writing for Chessbase and recently covered her most recent tournament on chessbase.com. I'll, I'll link to that as well. But I really did enjoy this sort of view of um, of professional chess. And one thing that struck me is, Irina, like if you play through people's games, you know, the location doesn't leave that much of a mark. You know, as a chess fan, you just look at the game and don't think about it that much. But just to see for an active player, you're going to so many places, like you spend so much time traveling. And luckily, you're an enthusiastic traveler, but it really brought into, um, it really made me note just, just how busy you are and how infrequently you are home and now you've been doing this for practically 10 years although you did manage to get a degree um but i'm so i'm just curious irena like a how often are you home and b like in the intervening years since you haven't been blogging as much if you're still enjoying the lifestyle as much as you uh primarily seem to enjoy when you were writing about it frequently oh uh, well yeah so I'm still definitely enjoying a lot my traveling lifestyle, though, uh, sometimes, uh, especially the pandemic, I was thinking, OK, how does it come that I know absolutely none of my neighbors? <laughs> 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 but uh, it has its downsides and uh, there are also, of course, positive things um, from the downsides. I mean, I've started to think about it more recently. You know, I was thinking that many times when chess players are unhappy perhaps with their contracts or with the conditions offered by their federations, they only think from the financial point of view. But I'm actually unhappy not because of that primarily, but because of the thing that chess is seen differently these days. I don't know, perhaps in the US it's different, but in Romania, um, if you tell someone that you're a chess player, perhaps they will know Elisabetta Polychroniade or I don't know, like uh, players from 50 years ago, and they would say, okay, and what is your profession? Right. <laughs> you know, like, and uh, I, I think that it would be a great job for uh, for our federations to start doing, uh, um, like, not start organizing, but giving invitations for chess players to join events where arts people or sports people or, you know, science people meet. Because you really need to get to know inspiring people uh, because it doesn't matter the field it broadens your horizons and 
gives you some inspiration. And uh, this is something which I really lack when I'm at home because I don't know anybody because all of my friends are from the chess world and they are in different parts of the world. So when I'm home, I'm just, okay, either <laughs> laying on the sofa and trying to catch a breath between tournaments right. or, you know, trying to work on my chess. But I don't have this uh, place where I could get inspired. And this is, I think, what in, back in the days chess was seen differently. Chess was something which was at the same level with, uh, I don't know, art, science, and so on. And this is this is not how things are in Romania, even though I believe things have gotten better than it used to be, but still this is the thing which I lack the most. Because, for example, I met a sculptor who represented uh, Romania in the World Expo in Dubai, and he had these amazing ideas with different sculptures. And he was thinking, wow, chess is so interesting. Perhaps I could integrate it in some of my sculptures. And actually, this is how I think sh things should work. I mean, perhaps somebody gets inspired from knowing a chess player and getting to know some things about chess. And perhaps I get inspired from their work, you know. And uh, yeah, this is something I would change. But other than that, I love traveling, of course, and I love discovering new countries. And I've actually mm, come to the idea that if each year I have an exotic uh, new country, uh, a, a tournament there, I get mm -hmm. inspired for the whole year. So in 2019, before the pandemic, I went to Vietnam and I really loved it. Like it was the most amazing experience I had uh, until this point. And uh, this year I went to Cuba <laughs> and I hope oh, right, it, will, yeah. it will have the same uh, impact on my chest as, uh, as Vietnam did. Yeah, um, I definitely want to follow up about your, your favorite chess venues. But on the topic of sort of professional support, um, I mean, I do think that that's definitely true to a degree in the U.S. as well. Um, I'm glad to hear that you say things are getting a little bit better in Romania, but it's interesting to hear you say that because one thing that that struck me in reading through your writing over the years is to me, it felt like it's, if anything, it's better there in the, in Europe than in the U S because you do have all these opportunities to play in these tournaments. You know, you might not be getting rich, but you're, you're able to, to see the world, to play in all these places. There's women's prizes, there's conditions. So I, I think here in the U.S., especially uh, for, for female players, um, a lot of them end up pursuing life outside of chess uh, after being top youth players. Um, so I definitely think there's, there's improvement both in Europe and, and in the U.S. Uh, that we can, we can hope for. Yeah, uh, I definitely knew that in uh, in the U.S. it's not so easy to make chess a profession, especially for female players. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to study in the U.S. Uh, one time it wasn't connected to chess, and the second time it was scholarship connected to chess. But uh, uh, I was afraid that uh, I might lose all my connections throughout leagues in Europe and all of that. And uh, yeah, I, I wasn't ready to take the risk. Yeah, I understand. Have you been to the United States, Irina? Nope. Yeah, it's amazing because you've been to so many places, you know, <laughs> like uh, on your blog, it was like 23 countries in like 2011 or 2012, you know, when you were not even uh, 20 years of age. Uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, I haven't traveled to the U.S. so far. No. <laughs> and. And on the topic of travel, I mean, obviously, I'm I've reasonably well traveled, and uh, you know, we could have a separate conversation about just our favorite places. But in the interest of this being a chess podcast, you've you've written, uh, you've played in a lot of sort of the big open tournaments. Like you seem to have a great time in the Thailand Open. I know you've played like Isle of Man. So I'm curious. Oh, I believe you played Sunway Sitges. Uh, which is high on my list. I have kids and they're pretty young, so I don't know when I'll make it to that tournament. But I'm just curious, like if you were to give like rankings for amateur players thinking of taking a trip or traveling within Europe uh, to big open tournaments, which ones would you recommend, Irina? Well, if it's within 
Europe, then, uh, well, I have to say that I'm a little bit biased and I have quite a big love for the UK. So I cannot help putting on the top Gibraltar and Isle of Man. Perhaps even Isle of Man will come first because it was, well, it's a difficult choice, Isle of Man or Gibraltar. They were both uh, really, really nice. And uh, that's mostly because I got the opportunity to play against players with whom uh, I would normally never get paired. I mean, before that, I played against 2,700 uh, players only in European Men's Championship. And that happened only because I started really well, because otherwise I wouldn't. But uh, yeah, they were, I mean, the whole atmosphere was really cool because the places are not that big and everything uh, is focused on chess the chess tournament gets a lot of attention there are a lot of side events and you feel you feel just great there and Sigis of course uh, I've been there in 2020 just in the time of the pandemic and I had a great experience there as well so I recommend uh, you go for this one as well. <laughs> yeah, the the pictures look look quite nice. Um, and do you do you know how many countries you've been to at this point, Irina? Mm, no, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a good good sign when when you've lost count. Um, and what about in terms of uh, events? Like obviously, we discussed the Olympiads coming up. Um, you, I know you've played in the World Rapid and Blitz. Um, is there a particular event that you enjoy the most? Aside from just big it's, open uh, tournaments? It's interesting. Uh, this is actually why that project I was thinking at the beginning is starting to grow in my brain because I've come to a point when I'm not enjoying as much as I hoped um, all these tournaments I usually play, for example, the leagues, all female tournaments, because my biggest dream for many years has been to become a grandmaster, a male, like <laughs> yeah. an all, uh, all time grandmaster. <laughs> yeah, not a woman so. grandmaster, just grandmaster. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to describe it either, but I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, and it's not easy to achieve that if you're playing in all female tournaments mostly. Uh, so you're lucky even if you have the opportunity by rating based or title based to play for, for this uh, title. And uh, I was thinking that perhaps next year I could uh, finally stop uh, thinking about, uh, because normally why you take all these leagues or weaker tournaments, it's because you want to have a financial benefit. You no, know? I mean, otherwise, if you could or if I could, I would only play the strongest <laughs> possible tournaments. And I was thinking to try next year to do so. And from that point of view, my all-time favorite used to be the European uh, Men's Championship. I actually uh, scored uh, my IM norms uh, there. I believe it was uh, 2013 and 2012. Yeah, because they were counting like double. And it was so nice and so challenging and to compete against 2,500, 2,600 players every game. If I would have the opportunity to do it or to redo my career, I would go only for the strongest possible tournaments because I think playing all female events is not going to bring you anywhere. And it's actually an idea I'm trying to pitch to our Romanian Federation that. Uh, um, I think it's important for girls, uh, even from a young age, from like under eight, under 10, there shouldn't be a separation in the like uh, girls, boys. They should play all together because there are fewer girls playing. So even from under eight, let's say there are 10% girls, 90% boys, uh, the fewer the numbers, the less strong the competition is and the progress, of course, will not be as high. I mean, as quick or, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think uh, I would redo that and play stronger tournaments. And, okay, I had to make a balance, like from the financial and professional point of view to try to think what is best for my growth and for my stability. 
and I made a choice. But if I didn't have to make that choice, I would go for the stronger events. And actually, they were the one which I enjoyed the most. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky issue. I mean, I know you mentioned that Judith Polgar is a personal hero of yours, as she is for for me and for so many others. Um, and of course, she's also been outspoken that she feels generally, definitely she feels for her, uh, playing open events was the best course. And she th feels that it's often uh, the best course for up and coming uh, female players generally. But then there's also the problem, Irina, you know, that like men can be jerks and <laughs> men can be obnoxious and they can make uh, they can make uh, an atmosphere less inviting for for women players. So how do you balance that? And for for young girl players. So how would you balance that? And like, would you still have room for some uh, female competitions? Would you just have female prizes within open competitions? Uh, what do you think would be the best way to handle things? I think the best way is to have uh, indeed the female prizes uh, inside the open competitions because you still get to play against the strongest possible opponents and uh, in the same time you can make a living out of it. So it will be like a compromise, like a passing stage uh, from what I see. I know what you say about the atmosphere indeed. There are incidents and sort of things like that. But uh, we shouldn't forget, uh, actually, I recently had a conversation about it with, uh, with a close uh, friend of mine who actually isn't connected to chess. And she reminded to me that uh, this is a problem we face everywhere. It's right. not only chess uh, which has it. So uh, it's not uh, something which uh, we should be shocked of or something. I mean... We are aware that this might happen, but okay, life is about challenges and overcoming them one way or another. So um, I, I don't see it as a big issue. I see it as, uh, how to say, just as a step which you have to overcome at some point and that's it. I mean, if you are aware of a problem, you are prepared to face it. So I don't see it as something terrible. <laughs> Okay. And do you think that things are moving in the right direction in, in that regard in the chess world? Oh, well, I, I was lucky, I think, uh, not to not to get in trouble with uh, these things too much. But uh, I think given that uh, the information is so accessible and uh, uh, things are, I mean, if something happens, everybody can write about it and make others aware. I, I, I think this helps a lot. And uh, with time, um, it should be more comfortable to play chess for, for everyone, actually. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I hope so as well. Well, Irina, we need to take one more break. And uh, then I want to discuss your approach to openings and your chessable courses. Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com, the leading chess education platform. Chessable, of course, uses its proprietary move trainer technology, which has space repetition to help you learn opening sequences, tactical patterns, basic end games, all of which it will quiz you on repeatedly until you have it down cold. They have courses both for free and for purchase. One of their newest includes the Beginner's 1D4 Repertoire by popular and entertaining YouTube commentator and streamer. I am Andres Toth. So if you're just looking to get your feet wet in an opening, it is a great uh, intro. And of course, they also have intermediate classics like Endgame Strategy and tons of advanced opening courses that you can check out for free or for purchase at chessable.com. And we are back. And as we record this, uh, Irina has just recently introduced uh, her second chessable course, the Smyslav Roy Lopez 3G6. And Irina, actually, her courses, at least this one, are openings that she actually plays. So I'm eager to discuss the course. But Irina, first, why don't we take like a big picture view? Or, like, what's, what's your approach been to openings? There are people who love studying openings. There are people who can't stand it. Where do, where do you fall on that spectrum? Well, um... I absolutely love studying openings and as I said in the beginning because of my mistrust <laughs> for any kind of coaches I uh, sort of developed this uh, way uh, 
I, I don't know if it's original. I mean, I cannot know how other players work on it. Not all of them, but I think it's uh, uh, it's a unique way for myself to work on them because I try to uh, base everything on uh, similarities, on associations and on ideas. So I don't necessarily remember everything move by move, but I try to create a big picture in my head. And sometimes I have like 10 exclamation <laughs> marks and some idea which is not connected to chess, but which reminds me of that move. And this is how the connections work in my head. And uh, well, probably my strength as a player um, is the flexibility in openings uh, because I can play many things. I have weaknesses, but this is one of uh, my strengths. And uh, I enjoyed a lot making this course for uh, for Chessable. I actually it is the second one. I made one more last year. And I realized that it just uh, gives me such pleasure. I mean, I never expected to enjoy anything else other than playing. I was not sure if I will ever enjoy coaching or anything. And I was so happy during the pandemic that I discovered that I enjoy some other things in chess other hmm. than playing. <laughs> and uh, Well, yeah. you knew you enjoyed writing, right? I mean, you, you were writing uh, at your peak. You were writing like hundreds of posts a year. So. <laughs> Yes, I don't know how I was writing uh, a post every every day, but uh, yeah, I had my moments. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so what's your approach to designing a course? How do you decide on 3G6 against the Roy Lopez? And like, how do you work with the, the engines as, a quo as opposed to games from top players? And, and, you know, I'm just curious about what, what goes into designing it, Irina. Uh, well, I started to work with these cloud engines uh, some years ago. I think it was 2019, actually, when I nearly lost the game playing my favorite line, which brought me a lot of points in the Nidorf against a player from Germany. And I just played my line. I played everything. I remembered my theory and I just got a plus. I mean, she got plus one point point five out of the opening and I realized that okay something is going wrong I have perhaps to <laughs> start switching on, on the cloud and uh, actually it was very interesting because uh, it uh, I had to reassess all of my openings uh, they many of them changed dramatically some of them just opened my eyes like I, I couldn't even think about some ideas um, so normally I try to build uh, the opening course in the same way I uh, work when I'm preparing an opening for myself. So first of all, I check uh, how many top players are playing it because it's uh, definitely an indication if the line is good or not. If you have 27 plus uh, players uh, going for it, then it's fine. If not, not, then I check the percentage. So. Uh, normally, a line, for example, from black side should be um, between 50 something and, okay, let's say ideally 60%. So black shouldn't score less than 40%, then it's a dubious line. And uh, well, if that works, <laughs> then I uh, uh, switch on the engine. Uh, and it's very funny because whenever I want to prove that white has an advantage, I go for stockfish. When I want to prove that it holds for black, then I go for lila. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's a pro trick right there. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, uh, yeah, and then I check the history of the line. I check inspiring, uh, inspiring games. Like, for example, in this course, Personally, for me, it was inspiring to see um, a game between uh, it was Pogonina with the white pieces and Galamova with the black pieces because well, mostly I play against ladies and I want to see how the strongest ladies lose or win in the variation I plan to play. But there was also the great uh, game which Mamed Yarov won against uh, Karakin in the candidates in round one in Berlin. And okay, if they play that candidates, then it's a sign that it's yeah, a sure. variation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're only recording after day three here in this candidates, but there's been some interesting opening developments already. Um, and so 
But how do you pick your opening? I mean, as someone who said you have a fairly <laughs> wide repertoire, like how did you settle on on the Bogo Indian for your first course and now uh, now Smith Love's uh, line against the Roy Lopez? Hmm. So you sensed that I was trying to avoid this question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actually, uh, for the second course of the Smith Lovery Lopez, uh, uh, I had a training session with uh, Lubomir and we watched a game. He showed me a game in this line and I thought, hmm, wow, that's, that looks interesting. And it was exactly around the time when I had to pick up some ideas for, uh, for the course. And then I remember that when playing with the white pieces, because of course I played the Rui Lopez and this G6, uh, I never really understood uh, what is the difference between G6 on move three or on move four, or if black starts with A6, D6 or with A6, G6. So I realized that it is not easy to play with white and then it's a good choice for black. Then. <laughs> Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And and let's be honest, uh, getting to what, what I was asking, like with, with Chessable, there's so many courses at this point that I'm sure also like you don't want to, you know, like I know there's at least three Nimzo courses, for example, like it, it can be, uh, you know, you don't want to make the 10th course on the same opening, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I checked it out and it looks good. I'm currently not a double king pawn player but i was thinking well maybe if i can play that against the roy you know like you know <laughs> maybe then it's like the skeleton of a repertoire so yeah d definitely uh definitely tempting uh to to get some some positions slightly off of the well-trodden roy lopez um paths um so Irina, i'm i've only got one or two more topics one is you know we've got what you have coming up through the olympiad scheduled but it seems like you know, I'm, I'm guessing you have some tournaments planned even beyond that for later this year. Yeah, I actually have a lot of tournaments planned. Uh, I, I think before the pandemic, I was the most active player in Europe, at least uh, among women, definitely, perhaps not even, maybe even among men. I'm not sure about that. And uh, I have slowed it down a little bit, but uh, still I have around 15 classical tournaments per year yeah not counting rapid and blitz so i'm packed <laughs> <laughs> anything you're looking forward to more than the others this year oh, good question i have one which i'm not looking forward to <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is the european women's championship where no matter how the year is going for me i always struggle i I, I seem to, you know, be cursed to score plus two there, no matter how it goes, starting with plus five or starting with minus two, I end up on plus two with all kinds of scenarios. But uh, I, st I still have the hope. The hope is alive. So uh, I will still play it. Um, and where is that? Uh, it will be in Prague one week oh, after well, the Olympiad. Well, that's nice, at least. Uh, that it's in Prague. <laughs> right. Do how like when you're thinking ahead to a tournament as someone who definitely clearly loves travel how how much do you think about where you'll be as opposed to the actual tournament very much i think that a big impact on my result in the capablanca memorial in cuba was the thing that i dreamed of visiting cuba i was yeah. visualizing it like every night before going to bed you know it was my last thought and my first thought in the morning so uh, it, it plays definitely a big importance. So I'm trying not to choose tournaments in venues where I know that I might feel uncomfortable or yeah, where I'm not so interested to play. And actually a tournament which I really hope to play this year is, uh, I'm not sure it will happen, but it's the Isle of Man Open. I heard that it might happen again in late autumn, but uh, I still don't have... Uh, mm, the confirmation of it okay yeah that's another one i would i would love to love to play someday and um so we know you had a great result in cuba i mean but did it did the the country itself live up to your expectations yeah it's interesting because uh uh well it was a double-edged sort of experience i i knew it will be something unique and um uh, very different to what I've seen so far, 
but I didn't expect for the country to struggle so much. So it was a little bit saddening. Uh, but I was lucky to meet uh, nice people. I was lucky actually to get friendly with uh, uh, with some people from Chessable working uh, and living in Cuba. And oh, nice. they showed me around and uh, it made me get the prospects uh, of how people living there see the things. Uh, yeah, it makes such a difference done. to know local people wherever one is. No, definitely, because I know some other players playing in the tournament had a terrible experience there. And we actually had, to, I mean, we were staying in the same place. We had the same opportunities to see things. But I think it's so different because uh, it depends what your expectations are and how open you are to, to new things. Yeah. This is why perhaps I think that maybe in back in 2011 when I was in India, perhaps uh, I wasn't ready for for uh, embracing it. Maybe yeah. this year will be different. Yeah, well, I, when I spoke with Grandmaster Ramesh, he did describe it taking place at like a beachside resort. So, uh, you know, potential food and socioeconomic issues aside, it sh hopefully it'll at least be a pretty venue and yeah, may maybe a... Uh, Hopefully things have, have improved from there. I know that they're working hard to uh, to set up a good event. So um, we will see. And Irina, your, your English is excellent. And obviously you're quite well traveled. So I'm just curious, how many languages do you speak? <laughs> well, I get around in quite a few, but uh, to speak, I speak Russian, Romanian and English. I'm decent, decent, but not more in German. And I can understand quite well French. And I've started to learn Spanish. But uh, I mean, my grammar in French is terrible. I know <laughs> words. I can say, un var de van rouge, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or uh, uh, una cerveza, por favor. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, other than that, uh, that's it. Well, it's it's pretty impressive to me. Um, well, Irina, this has been a lot of fun. Um, so really interesting to hear about all of your travels and you, your chess. Now, uh, on a closing note, you you've mentioned and you wrote about on your blog and you mentioned in our interview your your lifelong dream of pursuing the grandmaster title, and you alluded to sort of hoping that you could put an emphasis on on um, tournaments where it might be easier to pursue that. So is that still a, a burning goal for you, Irina? I think this is the only thing which keeps me going in, in chess. I, I'm not sure, you know, in the beginning it was just a childish dream. Then it was something which I thought won't happen. And now it's something which I understand that it really won't happen if I don't do something particular <laughs> in that direction. I mean, it always seems that you work towards some goal, but it never really is the primary goal to become a GM. It is to go to a tournament, to qualify somewhere, to get to play somewhere. And finally, I think that I'm ready to give it all especially since i've started to enjoy uh, training so much lately so uh yeah this is my dream and uh, i have another secret one <laughs> but it goes along well with this one <laughs> okay well that's that's great i mean we'll certainly be rooting for you and in terms of the the training like when you're fired up when you're inspired how, how much time are you able to to put into chess study hi I, I can work uh, I can work a lot if I have a goal I can work mm, doesn't matter how much I mean uh, when I'm working for myself it's like five hours perhaps when I worked for the course uh, it could be 10 hours a day <laughs> but uh, it depends how much uh, the subject interests me for example Michael Adams's book I mean when I picked it up I just uh, forgot about time Mm -hmm. And that's how it usually happens. I don't count hours. I just enjoy myself. <laughs> wow, that that's a great approach. Yeah, that that 
that's inspiring. Well, Irina, this has been amazing to hear about uh, all of your chess adventures. I think it really gives a perspective of the work that goes into maintaining your level, but also sort of the the miles log, the distance traveled. It's uh, truly impressive to, to see. So we wish you luck with your chessable course. The most recent one is called uh, Smyslav's G6. Um, I'll definitely be checking it out and working on my, my backup repertoire with it, um, as well as one on the Bogo Indian. And so you mentioned your blog you think is is dormant so any chance of resuming it or will you be writing for chess space i guess the, the main thing i'm asking is what's the best way for people to keep up with you Irina? uh well for now i guess that uh they should better check chess space for updates on me but perhaps from next year i will be uh, more up to date with the blog. <laughs> okay, and the the secret the other secret projects will will exactly. be revealed in time. Okay. They uh, you have a feel for them, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> All right, excellent. So, and you're on Twitter and Instagram, right, Irina? Yeah. Okay. Twitter is perhaps the best to okay. follow me. <laughs> excellent. So I will I will link to all of those. And yeah, good luck in Poland. Good luck in the Olympiad and uh, with the chessable course and and <laughs> everything else. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.